The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond and platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Uh, after it fails, because that's like going to happen. Um, but the other big reasons are that uh, I don't have here on my slide is that we're often, as, as, as sysadmins, asked to rush through doing something. And uh, we like to tell people yes and to build things. Um, so often I see, I see us you know, quickly throwing something together uh, as a like, one-off and then it not really having the quality behind it like that it should, which really just hurts us. Uh, because you like built this thing, there's no good documentation or if there is, it was documentation on how it was built. Uh, there's no ongoing like documentation. So the machines like really can't be like replicated. Um, so when they catch on fire, it's of course up to you to fix it, and you know you don't really know what that system's like. Um, well, this is my high tech uh, like cloud picture, and what I want to get from this is that uh, by being able to have uh, tons of hosts on on demand, uh, okay, so you can provision you know, 10,000 hosts by swiping your credit card, like big deal. How do you manage uh, those hosts? Like how do you manage their, their system states, their configurations? When you wanna make a change, how do you do that across all your systems? Um, if, if your answer is I'll just build a new image, um, you'll quickly find out that that, that doesn't scale. Uh, like who here has uh, built built clusters of systems by hand before? See some hands, yeah. And what you've probably like noticed is that if you didn't use configuration management, that entropy started to grow on those systems. So you started off and they were all the exact same mail system, uh, but then after time they started to develop personalities of their own, uh, uh, and, and and that's because you know you like you had to fix a problem here. You, you, like you updated something else there, you know, maybe that change got deployed across the mall, but maybe not. And after a while, you know, why is mail 27, why is it's, why is it's like mail queue always way behind? You know, they start to have their own like personalities. Uh, like we already talked about, uh, like disaster recovery, something's important enough to have once, you want it to be able to have it again. Um, I actually got into a habit of Reprovisioning machines, like whenever I did updates, so that we tested disaster recovery, which is often the week like people, if they plan at all, uh, but don't always like follow through to see that it works. Uh, by always provisioning new like systems, I saw every day that our disaster recovery program was working. Um, then like change management. So uh, once 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 you build a system, okay, that's great. I've got some system, but now how do I manage the change? And how do I manage that in pre-production environments like through production? Um, so right here, uh, before I, I started with Puppet, uh, thank you, uh, uh, I had to go through change approval boards for uh, like change management. Is anyone familiar with those? You get in a room and everyone says, no, we don't want you to make any changes. Uh, and so, after using Puppet for a while, my maintenance events were going uh, like rather smoothly. So suddenly, like the change approval process became easier and easier uh, within uh, like my organization. Um, we got uh, uh, a bit of some craziness at at, at the beginning. Uh, I started using Puppet in 2007 uh, to release a nationwide VoIP platform. Um, so. You know, lots of regulation with uh, uh, voice and ensuring that stuff works. I had to release to a bunch of systems all over the U.S. and a lot of pre-production environments. And so I was like, I got to have configuration management. Uh, I went out and tried a few of the different softwares. And very quickly, I got puppets to do things that were useful, uh, which is why I started using it. Well, like the next reason uh, for config management is the idea of infrastructure as code. Uh, and what you get from that is that 
you are building systems with code. You're managing systems programmatically. And as such, you can use the same tools that you might use for your other uh, like bits of source code. So uh, things like version control systems uh, to know like what's going on. Uh, simple tools like diff, you know, to see how did my infrastructure change, like just like your code change. Uh, continuous integration and collaborative tools like that. Um, I think if you get nothing else from my talk, I hope that we can all strive to write better commit messages and talk about why we made changes and not what we changed, because Diff does a really good job about telling us what we changed. Um, so Puppet itself is open source. Uh, we're packaged with uh, the major uh, like vendors. Uh, these stats are a little old. I think our mailing list is around 4,000 people and about 450 people at all times on Pound Puppet on Freenode. Um, we've got a lot of people contributing uh, code uh, like to us, both the Puppet code and the actual uh, classes that make uh, Puppet do things on your systems. So we are definitely an open source like company with a thriving community and it's not just us uh, pointing direction for everything. We recently, like recently released uh, Puppet e Enterprise, uh, which runs on the systems in blue. Uh, Puppet runs on the rest of the systems. Um, uh, I promise this isn't a sales pitch. Uh, Puppet Enterprise is new for us, and like people have uh, like questions for that. And so, like what we do is we we package Puppet uh, and bundle it in a way so that you can deploy it with best practices for scalability and uh, availability. Uh, Puppet itself is a web app, so it's written in Ruby, so you could run it as just mongrels, you could do reverse proxy with Apache, Nginx, uh, the Unicorn, there's a ton of different ways, so we pick the way that's gonna scale, which is with uh, like Passenger. Um, we encapsulate the installation, so all the packages have a PE like prefix like, to them, that way our version of Ruby and Apache doesn't interfere with your version. We install everything in, in a puppet, so it's totally encapsulated. And also that way you don't have to worry about keeping your app, uh, uh, that stack in sync with what you need for ours. So if we're still lagging, you know, and using Ruby 1.8 and you want to use Ruby 1.9, like you don't have to figure all that out. Um, Puppet's pervasive, so lots of, uh, like large clients, so if you're uh, thinking that you know you're going to be the like guinea pig, uh, like you're not. So uh, lots of folks like using us there. Somebody that's not on here that I thought was cool was we found out that uh, the German air traffic control like uses Puppet for their systems, which I thought was kind of neat. I'm still a little hot in the microphone here, I think. Um, so we'll get into how Puppet works. Uh, so. Like with Puppet, you're going to define uh, the state of your relationship uh, uh, with, like, with the system. So you just uh, define the system state, and you do that through like writing code. Uh, uh, then you can simulate uh, those changes on your system, which is great. So you can run Puppet and run it in a no-op mode, and it'll basically diff what you want your system to look like with what the system looks like then and tell you what it would do without actually like, doing anything, which is awesome uh, to be able to have a maintenance event where you already know like what's gonna happen. Uh, uh, and then it can enforce those like changes onto the system and anytime it does an enforcement, it sends off a report so you can see like what's going on. So like we do this by writing uh, Puppet code. Uh, you, like you don't have to know another like language. Uh, Puppet has a very simple uh, like DSL uh, that we will like get into, and you write code in uh, in a modular like format, and then you associate that code with the nodes or like with your systems. So that's where you have this node to code relationship where you say node dub 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 one is going to run my Apache module and my database system is gonna run my MySQL module, and they're all gonna run my security modules. And so you write these very like modular and reusable code, uh, and then associate it with, like, with the different nodes. Um, you can also download code at forge.puppetlabs.com. 
And so a lot of that work's been done for uh, like major applications. So. so we'll talk about how, how Puppet works. Uh, we'll start with blank hardware or lack of a VM. Uh, you'll go through a provisioning like process to a base install. And then on that, Puppet's going to configure the system into the role that you want it to be in, but then also maintain it in that system. So as system is now without configuration management, uh, you probably get to like to this far. Uh, if you're using something like Kickstart, you know you would uh, provision the system, and then you'd have some post section that runs, you know, all your uh, pile of Perl and Bash, and makes the system into a system. Uh, the problem with that is that, so you've built a system, like so what? Uh, there's nothing maintaining it and ensuring that it's staying in the state that you want it to be in, and that's where configuration management uh, like really helps. In terms of best practices, and this is really configuration management tool agnostic, is that you want this base install to be a minimal install. And so not a specific one for a database server versus a web server versus an app server, but you want just a very simplified base installation. And then on top of that base install, you will uh, like model things with the configuration management. And so that way you're capturing like what it is you want on your systems. Let's talk about uh, like managing configuration drift. So you've got the state of the system uh, that you want it to be in, and you're gonna identify this by writing code that says uh, what's, what the desired state is. So this could be as simple as saying, uh, I want Etsy pseudoers to always have permissions uh, 0, 400. Uh, and then that, that, that might drift out of state, like maybe it's uh, like mode uh, like changes. So Puppet would run and then bring that into the desired state again and actually make the change and put your system back to where it should be. Uh, like whenever it does that, it's gonna kick off a report and send that to the report server. Um, so we'll talk about like data flow. Uh, all of the communication with Puppet between the masters and the agents is all via SSL uh, and we use uh, certificates for uh, authentication. Uh, by default, we're a pull-based system, although we can be push-based, which means that the nodes uh, would wake up and like phone home and say, hey, what should I look like? And then like pull that back. Um, it starts off where the node sends information uh, called facts about itself uh, to the puppet master. The puppet master is able to take that information and do that node to code relationship where it says, okay, you're node dub 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 one, so you're an Apache system. Uh, it, it, it builds a catalog of what the system should look like uh, and sends it to the node, and then it's up to the node to apply that catalog in the way that makes sense. And then of course reports are kicked out to a reporting server. Uh, facts are automatically maintained asset inventory that's in real time whenever you query it. Um, it's gonna be a little hard to read, but facts are uh, like key value pairs. So we have a list of keys uh, and then their values over here. Uh, all of the keys are available as top scope variables within your code. So you can make uh, like conditional logic based on the information on your system. Um, so something you might do with this is let's say you want to key off your heap size that you use for Tomcat based on the total amount of memory on the system instead of having to know the amount of memory on your individual systems and like manage all that, you could do it like programmatically uh, and you know like base it on like total memory or something. But how many people in the room uh, program in Ruby? Okay, a couple uh, like Ruby programmers back there. Um, I don't program in Ruby, but I can still write custom facts. Um, so you, like you could use this code fragment and then put your facts uh, in the programming language of your, of your choice, or bash, or shell, or have them executed. Um, I think one of the first custom facts I wrote uh, dealt with a, a vendor supplied uh, binary to check the RAID status. 
And so the, uh, we had an issue where their program was uh, a multi-line text output. You know, if I was running it on the system, maybe it would look nice, but I'm trying to run this on tons of systems. Uh, so I was able to take that binary, you know, do some grep awk uh, like magic and then get the one field I actually cared about, which was is, is my rate array okay or degraded, you know, failed. Uh, make that a custom fact and fact and then do conditional logic based on that. So hugely useful uh, to have these. Now the next part is the catalog. So it's a comprehensive resource list of the desired state that you want the system to be in. And it's easily uh, like validated uh, prior to the client like running it, which means that you can run in a no-op mode and see what's going to change on your system before you actually do it. And then reports that get kicked off uh, are again comprehensive of every change made, and we correlate that to the resource that we're managing. So we might be managing a service, and so we say the service should be on at boot time and it should be running. Uh, and so if the service is not, you know, public can go in there, change it, and then you'll have a report that shows what happened and then correlated with, uh, like with your code. Um, methods we have for reporting, uh, HTTP, uh, syslog, RD graph, we can just store the files. The catalogs are in YAML format, uh, and then tag mail. Uh, tag mail is kinda cool because you can tag individual parts of your code and resources, and whenever there's a change, you can send a report via email. Uh, so a good example of this is, let's say you have a security team, and they have a security policy, like you can't SSH as root to your systems. Um, so you manage the SSHD config, you turn off, you know, like permit root, uh, and then somehow that gets turned back on. So Puppet's like gonna run, it's gonna put your system back in the state you want it to be in, but now it can send an email to the security team to say, hey, there was an incident. Uh, and if you use you know, a tool like RT or something where you can take your email and turn it into a ticket, well now Puppet's just logging tickets like for you. Uh, the cool thing about this is, is that you know the time that uh, you were brought back into compliance, and if you look at the last Puppet run, you could tell the time that you were out of compliance, uh, which is huge if, uh, if you have any security or like compliance concerns like that, because you know the window that you were out, uh, like when it was fixed, and now there's a ticket, so the security guys can go over and uh, bug the people that run that system. Here's our dashboard, which is a web-based like GUI uh, to like give you an idea into it. Uh, it has simple red-green uh, type of interface so you can easily see on all your nodes. Are they okay? Have any nodes not checked in recently? Like what's going on? Uh, from that, you can actually go in there and see all the errors just like you would see them if you were consoled into the machine. Um, uh, like this is actual Puppet code itself and uh, what I really like about Puppet is that I talk about uh, what I want the system to be. Uh, we're a declarative language and we model things as opposed to how to do them. And so this code here says I have a package resource uh, named NTP and I want to ensure that it's installed, right? So notice I didn't say uh, use yum, I didn't say use apps, I just said there's a package called NTP and I want it. Um, I really like that. I mean, at the end of the day, I like to build systems. I don't really care about like, like memorizing, you know, is it add user or user add and what are all the flags that I make to make it happen. Um, that's really not important. Um, so you write this code, this is on the server, uh, and then the individual nodes they have what we call providers, and this is just a listing of the package providers, so you can see there's tons of ways uh, to evaluate packages. And so the nodes themselves take this code, and then they say, oh, I'm a Debian system, so I'm gonna use apt, or I'm a CentOS system, I'll use yum. Uh, and they do that to know, you know, how to evaluate that resource. So same thing with like users, uh, cron tabs, things like that. 
this, this lets us uh, scale, makes everything very like pluggable. Uh, so you can easily write your own providers and types. Some example ones, uh, ones that are most common would be like package, service, file, exec, and cron. Um, lots of different resource types, and then it's, it's easy to extend these and create your own. So here's the most common design pattern. Um, if you can only do this with Puppet, you can do a ton. And so this, like this design pattern is the package file service. Like most of the things that we do as admins is get some like service running. So first we have to install some package. Uh, then we have some config file where we like, you know, twist the knobs. Uh, then we have a service that pops out at the end. Um, since Puppet is declarative, uh, and non-deterministic, you have to uh, create these relationships between resources if you want ordering to happen. So since we want you know, the package, then the file, then the service, uh, we, we do things here like say require package NTP, so that way this will happen before the file. And then this service is gonna subscribe to the configuration file. And what this does is say if that file ever changes, uh, let's let's also help the service, and so uh, this will install NTP on your system, and then if you ever changed your NTP conf, uh, the service would get restarted like for you. So again, the most common design pattern, and you can see how we are modeling the system. We're not telling it to do certain things. We're saying this is what you should look like, and then Puppet's going to enforce uh, that state. Puppet has built-in file serving, so you use this uh, like URI, and you can serve up files. Um, and we and we also do like templating. Uh, the templates we didn't reinvent the wheel; we just use Ruby's ERB to do uh, for our templating engine. Um, you see here we have these are variables. Uh, these are actually facts, which are available as top scope like variables. And then this is just an example to show you can use a bit more advanced things with ERB. This is basically, so this is modeling a, uh, a, a resolver, like you're at C resolve conf. And so we see where it's, you know, like putting in a search path. And then this is basically doing a for loop over the array. Uh, you can also do inline Ruby and all sorts of uh, like fancy stuff with the templates. This is a bit hard to read, but syntax uh, by checking. Uh, I have aliases for my shell that let me do like syntax checking uh, when working with Puppet. I would also strongly suggest putting in syntax checks in your version control systems uh, like pre-commit hooks. Uh, you can definitely write syntactically correct code that's still bad, but uh, you know at least don't accept code that's not even gonna pass a syntax checker. Next we'll get to store configs, uh, which gives you the ability to pass data between nodes. So, so far we've talked about uh, nodes interacting with a puppet master, and so this allows you to pass data uh, between, like, between your nodes and without them having to know about each other. Uh, we do that through using a proxy, and we use a database as a proxy system. We support the you know main databases you expect to see: MySQL, SQLite, Postgres, Oracle. And how it works is we have one node, and in this instance, they're exporting their own like host entry uh, to the Puppet Master, and they're shoving that into the database. And then these other nodes are realizing uh, all of the host entries from the database. Uh, and in this way, we would have. Uh, systems that always had up to date, uh, like host entries for, for everything. Um, something a bit more useful than host entries, uh, like people often use this technique for SSH, uh, like host keys, and that way you can enforce, like your node doesn't have to know about the rest of them, but they all will have up to date, uh, like host keys. And then you can use uh, another resource to say, I only want entries in, my ho in the host keys file that I've explicitly uh, like talked about. So if somebody tried to add some key in here, next time Puppet ran, it would remove it and keep it up to date. Um, 
Uh, next is the ENC, external node like classifier. Uh, external node classifiers allow you, in, uh, instead of having that, uh, like a text file where you basically say, this is my node and this is the code that runs on it, you can query some other system. So if you work at a place uh, or, or, or already have like an asset inventory, so you, like you already have a database of all of your nodes, maybe where they are, IP information, stuff like that, like you don't want to duplicate that data. So you could write a script uh, to query the system you already have uh, and then output it to YAML. Uh, so this is great if you already have a database you know, some, some big pile of Perl and Tickle from like 10 years ago you can't get rid of. Uh, you can still use what you already have. Uh, like you can also use the Puppet dashboard as an ENC. Uh, to do it, you just write a script that takes the cert name as an argument and then it's just gonna dump uh, the output uh, to standard out in YAML. So you would take, uh, this is what the code would look like for your node to code relationship. You have a node with some name uh, we're setting some variables, and then we're including these classes. So we're saying this system's gonna have a common class, Puppet, DNS, NTP. Um, and then our script would take this and turn it into YAML and output this, and then I've got an external node classifier. So it's, it's like pretty easy to write, to, to, to write your own. Um, I was hoping we can get into uh, like Q&A. Uh, right now I can see everybody out there. Uh, like, does anyone have questions uh, about Puppet, uh, Puppet stories that like they'd like to share? Yeah. Sure. So the gentleman asked, "How do you deploy Puppet into an ex existing environment?" And so uh, a way to do that is to uh, start small and iterate and increase your coverage. So start by managing, you know, something small like Etsy stores, and then uh, start like managing like whole systems uh, until you're managing the entire system. Uh, like really, the way that you test that you've managed the that you're properly managing a system is you you decommission the old one and you build one out entirely from the ground up with configuration management and your provisioning system, and then you prove that your disaster recovery works. Uh, and you prove that you're totally managing everything that's important for that system because you just uh, decommissioned the old one. I'm, I'm sorry, could you speak up? Sure, so like the gentleman asked if we uh, work with VMware to manage the infrastructure. Uh, we're currently uh, have code out now that works with EC2 to provision instances there, uh, but not specifically with like VMware. Uh, though you could use uh, Puppet with uh, something like VI Perl or something to uh, manage your VMware. Um, yeah. So like normally in the stack, like what I see is uh, people like writing code that sets up their VMs and then does some sort of provisioning, and then at the end of the provisioning, uh, Puppet's called and then like manages the system. Yeah, so I've like built a cloud before like that where I used VMware and Cobbler in conjunction with, uh, like with Puppet. Cobbler's a great tool from Red Hat and it works on Debian, uh, Windows, Solaris, like tons of stuff. Yeah, sure. So uh, often uh, for the store configs, uh, I, I use MySQL myself, and uh, uh, yeah, I can just query that with uh, like SQL. So, yeah. Sure, so like the gentleman asked me to explain the enterprise like version. Um, the enterprise version uh, is open source and it, it, it has a cost associated with it uh, that's tiered by node and so that allows you to buy support and have a supportable system. It's also, uh, the software is encapsulated so it doesn't interfere with the, the software that's already on your system. Yes, sir.
Sure, so uh, like the gentleman asked uh, to discuss rolling back uh, updates um, that were an issue. So going back in time is um, impossible. Um, I haven't figured out how to build a time machine yet. Um, you can't really do it uh, with systems. Uh, you can approximate it. And so to do that, uh, you would keep your puppet code in a version control system, but then you also have to have your data versioned as well, uh, as well as have all of your uh, repositories like versioned. Because if you only go back with puppet code, but all of your packages have moved forward, you know, things might not work. Same with, okay, you can take the state of the system back, but if your data has gone forward, how do you deal with that? So I try to encourage people, instead of thinking about rollbacks, uh, to think about like rolling forward. So like fixing the problem and moving on. So you could do that, but you haven't actually rolled back anything. So he said uh, you could uninstall something and then reinstall the right version. But you actually haven't rolled back the system. You've just changed the state of the system into a somewhat broken state to a different state. But that's, that's not really rolling back. Like the end result might be that, but the system state isn't actually like rolling back. Uh, Sure, so uh, like he's asking about how to deal with uh, specific configurations during provision time. And so uh, you, you, uh, you'd have that minimal base install, uh, and then you would manage what you want on, on that system, like you would manage it with your configuration like management tool like Puppet. Uh, in terms of how you handle the packages, I would um, basically version control my package repositories uh, I mean, there's, there's really like two ways to change uh, how systems get packages. Either you update uh, configs on the client that say, look in these new like places every time you want to change it, or you go to the place that the packages are and you change the, uh, like where things are served from. So it's a lot easier to change where things are served from, you know, use sim links to where they actually are, things like that um, to keep your data in line. Um, in terms of like branching, and stuff, uh, I just say it's, it's, it's important to have your public things under version control as well, like your public code there. Um, yes? Sure, so there's order of, uh, like he asked how you deal with uh, having multiple repositories on a system and multiple package like managers. Um, I hope you don't have multiple package managers on your systems, but if you do, you can specify that. So like in the code you saw package NTP, I could tell it uh, explicitly uh, provider is apt, and I can run apt on my Red Hat system if that's how I roll. Uh, so like you could do that. Um, as well as uh, managing your repositories. You can manage repositories. There's uh, repo types uh, in Puppet to easily like manage those, uh, as well as doing it at provision time. Yeah. Like any other questions? Puppet stories? So he asked if I keep SVN snapshots and I keep old versions of systems around. Yeah, so um, I could 
Sure. So, like, won't go totally into change like management, uh, as I don't have a bunch of time here today. But like, what I would do is have at least two systems. Like, I'd probably have three or four or five, where I have like dev, QA, prod, uh, and then I would have my own testing area around the around the puppet code. So, I mean, prod and QA and all those things are always going to be lagging behind my development area. And once I'm uh, uh, confident with some code, I'm going to tag that and then propagate that tag out through my environments. Like any other questions? All right, well, uh, like thank you everybody for coming out and having me here. Uh, it was uh, like great being here my first year itself. And tomorrow, if you're interested uh, more in Puppet, I'm doing a tutorial uh, from nine to four. And so you'll get the training materials that normally costs like $2,200 for a three-day like training course uh, and I'll be compressing that course into one day and we'll be like going over that tomorrow and that's from nine to four. Right, thanks everybody. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. OS, an OS that works the way that you do across all your devices. HP Slate and WebOS. HP.